Welcome to a new video made by Grebo Games. I'm Grebo, and I'll talk a bit about what's happening in the video you're watching and share my personal thoughts on the topic in general. Let's start immediately with the very first phase of every hobbyist, namely the cleaning of the miniature. I'd like to understand what people receive when I read things like, Oh, but here, there are some support residues to remove. Support residues. Let me understand. Are the miniatures you buy always already cleaned and ready? Tell me the brand because for 40 years I've been buying miniatures and not once have I not had to clean a mold line, a miscast, fill a bubble, or file something down. All right, all right, back to us. With the blade of a utility knife, we scrape the surface we believe needs to be cleaned of any imperfections then use the blade to cut away any protrusions left from a 3D print or a cast. It's very simple and quick. Anyway, let's move on to priming e-basing. We start with the base using any method. At this moment, I prefer using an airbrush because it allows me greater control over the color coverage and the direction that covers every hidden nook and cranny of the model. Once I've applied the black primer, I begin with the base color that I want to appear as the deepest shadow. For this phase, I use Molotow colors, which are highly pigmented and very fluid, to ensure good color coverage. I want to create an almost albino model and have chosen purple as the base. Then, with a delicate touch, I try to properly base the armor parts, since with the same gentle hands I've practically covered the entire model earlier. I'll make the armor red, so the base will be brown. As you apply the layers of color, trying to give a sense of gradient, leaving shadows in the recesses and highlighting the exposed parts. It will often happen that the color spills over the boundaries you intend to set. If it spills over slightly, don't despair. Leave it as it is, as it won't be noticeable later on. I see that you apply a series of colors that seem random, and then you practically cover all the color given before. Are you sure it works like that? Well, I'd like to apply it better. The idea is to already provide a good range of shades using the airbrush. It's just that without a color scheme to follow, I go by eye. Therefore, always make sure to print a reference image so that you don't waste time applying random layers of color, even though at this specific moment I feel the chosen colors are good. The blue will give movement to the albino part, just as the yellow will brighten the armors in the adjustment phase. It seems more pink than yellow. Try to understand how it works rather than just copying what I'm doing. Use the airbrush starting from a dark base and gradually lightening up, covering less area each time, similar to how you use a brush for highlights. Don't be afraid to end up with an extremely light model as the final effect because later on, especially if you use oil washes, everything will become much darker and regardless, you will have to highlight again. If the base is too dark, then after the shading phase, you'll end up with a very dark model. Indeed, I used to use a brush for these things, but with the airbrush, it takes just a fraction of the time. A similar effect can be achieved with the slap chop technique. We've already mentioned it and we'll show it sooner or later, I promise. The final color has nothing to do with the initial one. Yeah, I told you, if it's not light enough, you'll regret it later. Trust me. Okay, I believe you. Now we move on to the phase where we will use the brush. Actually, we will always use it from now on. Anyway, let's adjust the color tones. Mostly, it's probably me who, not having yet understood how to use the airbrush, but only hypothesizing why I use it this way, find myself adjusting the color tones using a small brush. For this, I use a Winsor & Newton Series 7 size 1 brush with long bristles, but a short bristled one is also fine. In general, any brush that you feel comfortable spreading the color with is good, as long as it doesn't have a bent tip. Sometimes I buy some that bend after using them three times. Spend more, spend less. My grandmother used to say, better to buy one for 15 euros once than many for a few euros each that then have me cursing enough to scare pigeons away from cathedrals by a barrage of curses. So far, have you seen what I've done? Using the red from Speed Paint 2.0 and diluting it further with water, I adjusted the tones of the armor that I initially declared I wanted to be red, but that with the airbrush turned out. Well, not red. But as I was saying, the highlights I applied earlier have now all come back to me. 
It's effectively a color filter that we apply, taking advantage of the previous lighting. Now I'm doing something different that isn't just applying a color filter, but also creating a transition with a gradient. I'm trying to change the tip of the wings, which is currently white, to a dark purple. And to do this, I apply layer upon layer of the color I want to achieve. However, these layers are not of pure color, but are very diluted, allowing for a very gradual change and consequently a very pleasant faded effect. This can be done directly with glaze medium or with water. While water can be used to dilute acrylic paint and control the glaze through this dilution, glaze medium offers greater control over the paint's consistency and transparency, in addition to maintaining the integrity of the acrylic binder, making it a better choice for specific techniques like glazing and blending colors. That said, I use both without consistency, but based on what I feel at the moment. That last statement is great. Useful for those trying to follow a tutorial. Sarcasm. If you notice, I go over the same spot again and again. This is what I meant by layering the veils. You've never used this term before. But it conveys the idea well. Veil after veil, I have extreme control over the color transition, whether it's the edge of the nose, a lip, or the membrane of the wings. Do you use your thumb as a color palette? I see it's nicely striped. I use it to unload the brush. When picking up the paint from the palette, whether thick or diluted, the bristles tend to get overloaded, leaving an excessive layer of paint on the surface. So it is always common practice to unload the brush in the stages following priming. If the paint is too thick, there's a risk of leaving a visible and tangible layer of paint, like a step. It's okay if you started painting miniatures 10 minutes ago, but after 20 minutes, you should stop using the paint too thickly. It's just not done. No, no. On the other hand, if the paint is very diluted, then having the brush loaded means unloading it directly onto the miniature without the slightest control, ending up with all the paint seeping into recesses and parts you didn't want to paint. Once the glaze highlights have been applied, like now on the armor, you move on to using a slightly less diluted color to retouch the various edges and give even more volume to the lights. The practice of using a very light color applied around the edges of volumes is the simplest and most effective way to obtain bright edgings and a light effect. There are those who say not to do it. That blah blah blah. Tell them shut up and mind your own business. You do it because it looks good and it's quick. The process of color adjustment obviously applies to every part of the model. Right now, I'm working on the parts that I will make gold, giving them a base color more suitable for approaching the golden NMM non-metallic metal. Don't expect anything excessively virtuosic, but rather a respectable final effect. After all, we're not doing competition-level painting, but high-level painting still intended for gaming. Armed with a palette for offloading the paint for the dry brush technique, it's time to speed up the highlighting of the fur. So, with the brush suitable for dry brushing, one that's nice and full of bristles, which will be roughed up, load it with paint, unload it on the palette or on a piece of paper or cloth, and start brushing the parts you want to highlight. It goes without saying that using smaller brushes gives greater control over the area you want to highlight. Great, it's time for oil shading. Ever since I learned it, I use it constantly, 8 times out of 10. I would get a different effect, but after many mistakes, I've squared the circle. First, choose the colors you want for shading. Magenta and blue for the fur parts, brown for the gold, red for the armor, and black to darken the various colors and shade the darker parts. Work with one color at a time, placing some in its compartment and gradually adding a few drops of white spirit. I use the Tamiya brand because there's nothing else decent available in Italy. Do not use mineral spirits as it doesn't have the same effect when it comes to removal and turpentine. Creates problems with the primers. As you can see, just touch the brush to the surface, which in this case should not be unloaded from the paint, but instead should be quite full. And as soon as it touches the surface, you will see how quickly it spreads into every nook and cranny of the surrounding area. Do not cover the entire surface with the same color. In the case of the fur, play a bit between blue and magenta to give it movement, 
but the same principle applies to any part of the model. Using multiple well-considered colors will add dynamism. It's time to remove the excess oil. As always, wait categorically for the oil to dry, which you can tell by the fact that the shine has gone, leaving a matte patina. Removing it earlier will cause the white spirit diluent within the oil shade to bind to the pigment of the underlying acrylic, removing it along with the rest. And we don't want the work done up to now to be removed in a swipe of a cotton swab. The removal process is both satisfying and simple. Start with a cotton swab, which has less removing power compared to a makeup sponge. The goal is to remove the excess and create a well-blended transition from shadow to light. So, moderating your strength while touching the surface with the cotton swab, start gently and gradually increase the pressure to achieve the desired removal. You will gradually find the ideal force to apply, so start slow as there's always time to increase the pressure. If there is a dried oil puddle left, use the cotton swab to blur and soften it. Once you feel you've blended everything well, you can use one of those things used to apply makeup to people's faces. Wow, what refined terminology. You could have said the thing to do stuff and it would have yes, sounded better. it's visible in the video. Use it to further remove oil from the highlight points because both the makeup sponge and the thing for doing stuff have greater removing power. To summarize, make sure you have enough things at home to do things. This is the key lesson of this video. Good. Now that we've removed the oil and the model already looks great, let's go further and refine with the highlights that we didn't apply earlier or adjust those that got a bit dimmed during the shading. Here. I am using the glaze medium mixed with gray because I want to retouch those parts of the fur that got too stained with the shades, or the parts that I want more highlighted, like the arch of the eyebrows. Putting aside the glaze and using the color a bit less diluted, I now begin to paint the fur. Many and many tiny dashes that, when layered, give a beautiful fur effect. Just what's needed for everyone suffering from tennis elbow. Micro movements, repeated ad infinitum. To achieve a better result, you can paint some hairs darker here and there, as well as some lighter ones. Try not to be too uniform, because in fur, what really stands out is the micro imperfection of color that single darker or lighter hair placed here and there that gives movement to the fur. There's not much else to say. Arm yourself with patience and paint hair upon hair until you are satisfied, obviously taking care to give the right directional sense. Don't do them randomly. Otherwise, they won't look like hairs, but more like scratches or random marks. If there are other details you've left behind, like the small and negligible detail of the eye, which in this case is a ball occupying half the face, now is the right time to work on it. I chose a bright azure, so I went back to the base color, coloring the entire eyeball with a pigmented and undiluted layer. Afterward, I first made a white dot in the center, and from there with glazes, I lightened everything up, creating a poor man's glowing effect, because in the end, it doesn't shine incredibly in this eye, but it can't be said to be flat either. Come on, it turned out to be a nice piece, didn't it? See you next time, folks.